Hello folks, and welcome back to episode two of my commentary on Gilbert Gottfried's Genjo Koan. And if you want to know why it's Gilbert Gottfried's Genjo Koan, go look at episode one, that'll explain everything. And if you realize how much elaborate stuff I had to go through to make this green screen effect work, and I'm still getting it right, uh, anyway, uh, this has been fun. One thing I would advise you, and, and just a passing thing, if you are having a lot of trouble dealing with this isolation and whatnot that they're doing with this whole lockdown thing right now, uh, learn something new today. <laughs> Yesterday I learned how to do green screen, and that project and, and successfully completing it just made me feel infinitely better. So there's a little lesson for you for whatever it's worth. Last time, I did not explain what Genjo Koan is, so I thought I'd uh, do a little bit of that at the beginning here. Genjo Koan was originally written by Dogen in the year 1233, so he would have been 33 years old when he composed it, and it was written as a letter to a person who is only identified as Yo Kosho, who lived in Kyushu. We don't know anything about Yoko Kosho. He must have been somebody, we assume it's a he, who was interested in Buddhism and that Dogen was writing to. But he obviously thought very highly of this piece because he edited it, uh, edited it, well, how do you say that? He f fixed it up again in the year 1252. So 20 years later, or almost 20 years later, after he first wrote it, he was still kind of rewriting it and making it you know, nicer. So the version we have was the 1252 version. Nobody knows what the 1233 version, how different that might have been. And he also placed this first in when he compiled a 75 chapter version of Shobo Genzo as his kind of preliminary version of it. He put Genjo Koan as the first chapter. So this is something that he thought was really important and that he apparently thought he got it right in this, uh, in this little piece of writing. Also, the word Genjo is a strange word that there are a myriad, to use one of those terms you find in Buddhist books, interpretations of what Genjo means. Nishijima Maroshi says realized. I believe that Tanahashi calls it actualized or actualizing the fundamental point. Nishijima Maroshi calls it the realized universe. It's all very uh, odd, and the word Genjo is not a word that Dogen made up, but it's a specifically Buddhist word, so it doesn't really turn up in any other context other than Buddhist writings. But Dogen used Genjo a lot in his writings, and, and it usually means to actualize or to realize or to understand or to put into effect something that you have understood. And koan, uh, usually people uh, associate it with the funny stories about, you know, what is the sound of one hand clapping and all that stuff. Here it probably means a, a question or a, a, an issue. So I, I think the, the realized universe is a good translation. That's what Nishijima and Cross made. Actualizing the fundamental point, I believe, is the Tanahashi translation, and I think that's good too. So it's a hard one to understand and most people kind of just leave it untranslated you know they just call it genjo koan so with that being said let's go listen to a little bit more of genjo koan as read by gilbert godfried but not really gilbert godfried uh, my friend chris pretending to be gilbert godfried so here you go gilbert godfried to carry yourself forward and experience myriad things is delusion. That myriad things come forth and experience themselves is awakening. Those who have great realization of delusion are Buddhas. Those who are greatly deluded about realization are sentient beings. Further, there are those who continue realizing beyond realization who are in delusion throughout delusion. When Buddhas are truly Buddhas, they do not necessarily notice that they are Buddhas. However, they are actualized Buddhas who go on actualizing Buddhas. Since, oh, that's going to look weird. I bet that looks see-through, doesn't it? Does that cover look see-through? Oh, that'll be funny. Anyway, <laughs> since... Chris is using the version written by, or translated by, Kazuaki Tanahashi. I thought I'd give you the version written by, or translated by, Nishijima and Cross. And here's what they say for this passage. Driving ourselves to practice and experience the myriad dharmas is delusion. When the myriad dharmas actively practice and experience ourselves, that is the state of realization. 
Those who greatly realize delusion are Buddhas. Those who are greatly deluded about realization are ordinary beings. There are people who further attain realization on the basis of realization. There are people who increase their delusion in the midst of delusion. When Buddhas are really Buddhas, they do not need to recognize themselves as Buddhas. That's a lot to unpack. So driving ourselves forward to experience things is delusion, and that's normally what we do. We, we imagine that we have our, our own experience of the world, and we're going to go out, and the world is sort of passively there, and we are the ones who experience it. Dogen flips that around and says that the world experiences us, the universe experiences us. And we don't normally think of things that way. And when I first came across this passage, I thought he was being, you know, um, flowery and poetic or something like that. But I think he's actually speaking very literally. The, the, the world literally experiences us. Now we can understand that in terms of other people. Obviously, if I talk to my girlfriend or something and say, hey, can I put butcher paper, or green paper all over your bedroom wall, then uh, she experiences me saying that. But also the bedroom wall experiences me and everything experiences me and and I am experienced by those things. And when we open ourselves up to that, then a kind of a newer understanding appears. But it's difficult to kind of get that understanding. It's difficult to kind of work it out. But I, I think in my own case, I just sort of started at first just pretending it was like that and just seeing how life was if I pretended that the ground I was walking on experienced me or I was being experienced by it. And it's very interesting, so try it out sometime. Those who greatly realize delusion are Buddhas. Those who are deluded by realization are ordinary beings. That's a kind of, to me, that seems like an easy one. Buddhas are Buddhas who understand what delusion really is. One of the ways that I kind of relate this to is a story I've told before because somehow I had this uh, person in my life who was a Christian who talked to Tim McCarthy, my first Buddhist teacher, and at some point in the conversation he said, Tim said to, to this person, uh, Brad will never be enlightened. And she, this person reported it to me, and I was kind of depressed about that. Later on, it transpired that, that Tim had never really said any such thing. He he'd probably said that, he said, but he, he meant that what this person thought of as, as enlightenment was crazy, so nobody gets that kind of enlightenment. But anyway, feeling like I was never going to get enlightened, I decided, well, okay, I'm just going to try to, and I'd never read Dogen at this point, but I, I thought I'm going to try to realize delusion. I'm going to be try, I'm going to try to fully experience my delusion. And that made a, a big difference in my practice, and it's something I recommend. You know, don't, don't drive yourself to find a realization that's over there. Realize your own delusion. Get fully immersed in your own delusion and see what that is. And that is a way to have a kind of real realization. There are people who attain realization on the basis of realization, and there are people who are deluded in the midst of delusion. Again, these are kind of easy ones. Uh, you can always go further with any sort of realization that you have, and you can always go further in any sort of delusion that you have. So um, that's kind of the message I get from that one. It's the next line that I really like. And in the Nishijima Cross version, it says, When Buddhas are really Buddhas, they do not need to recognize themselves as Buddhas. Nevertheless, they are Buddhas in the state of experience, and they go on experiencing the state of Buddha. That I find really interesting. So a Buddha doesn't necessarily recognize herself or himself or themselves or however you prefer your pronouns to go as a Buddha. So it isn't it isn't like uh, like that guy who I won't name who goes on the internet and gets ten thousand or a hundred thousand views saying how much of a Buddha he is. That's not the the way this works. Your your understanding, your, your understanding that you are a Buddha is not necessarily something that you are consciously aware of, but you always have it. No matter where you go and what you do, you always have that Buddhahood there within you because that is the basis of your existence, that the, the realization, the enlightenment is the basis of your existence. You can't get away from it. 
the only thing you can do is become very, very confused about it and then start to do the wrong thing. And that's kind of what Buddhism is working on. So you don't have to realize yourself as a Buddha. You don't have to have this moment of like, boy, I just noticed that I'm a Buddha. In fact, for some people, that's worse. <laughs> you know, that, that causes more problems than, uh, than not knowing at all. And that's how I get, that's what I get out of that line. And, and I really think that's uh, solid stuff. So there you go. That's today's episode of Gilbert Gottfried's Genjo Koan. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll come back next time or maybe not. I, I haven't decided if I'm going to do one of these every day or skip and then come back to it. But, but I'll do an episode three and I'll get all the way through the whole thing. I promise. <laughs> Unless I, you know, get the creeping crud and, and, and die from it. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think we need to stay encouraged these days. And for my part, I am not looking at the scaremongering news. My philosophy about that stuff is... If, if the worst case scenarios are true or not, it doesn't really affect much about what I'm going to do. You know, I'm still going to wash my hands. I'm still going to practice social isolation. I'm still going to follow the protocols as long as they're in effect. And, and I don't need to hear the latest death count and I don't need to hear some projection that it's going to get even worse or whatever. So I'm not looking at that stuff and I'm letting, letting the, the real information that I need kind of get to me. And so far it has always gotten to me. Every bit of information I needed to know about this crisis has made its way to me somehow. And I think that's something we can all sort of just rely upon. We'll, we'll get the information. We don't need to feed our heads with this scary stuff. And, uh, and if you like to look at the positive stuff, I think that's fine. I think there are, there are different projections, and I tend to prefer the optimistic ones. And, and I don't care that much uh, whether the pessimistic ones are the actual ones that are true. I like the optimistic ones, and I'm not going to do anything any different whichever one I look at. So, you know, I might as well look at the ones I like, right? There you go. As always, my PayPal and Patreon information is below to donate to me. That's how I make my living and so on. As always, I know everybody's worried about the finances right now. So if you want to take a break from donating to me, that's fine. I will manage. But uh, as long as you keep donating, that is very nice. And I really, really super thank you for that. So we'll see you next time. So long. Bye.